Welcome to St Stephen's, Lansdowne and the North Slopes of Bath and to Mary's Chalcombe, that benefice of which I am the Rector and it's great to be with you as we gather to worship God and we do gather, we're in different places, we're watching at different times but by God's Spirit our intention to worship God and our intention to be together are all in God's hands and it's wonderful that we can worship as a community online. You may just be able to hear the strains of the organ coming from St Stephen's. That's Andrew Russell, our organist and choir master, who is practicing for Sunday as I record. And I'm really looking forward to the first week after Easter. We've come outside for a particular reason and that will hope will become obvious we're going to be reflecting on celtic theology again today as we did on easter sunday uh, although it's quite a weird thing to bear in mind when we hear the gospel reading which we will shortly but i hope it will make sense i'm going to read an opening prayer from this book uh, which is um, celtic daily prayer uh, one Celtic night and day prayer from Iona um, and this is the opening prayer for us so let's sit quietly for a moment and then I'll read for us O God who brought me from the rest of last night to the new light of this day bring me in the new light of this day to the guiding light of the eternal. Lead me, O God, on the journey of justice. Guide me, O God, on the pathways of peace. Renew me, O God, by the wellsprings of grace, today, tonight, and forever. Amen. So our gospel reading from John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus again said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his sight, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. So two scenes from a locked and stifled room, but now we've come outside into the wonderful woodland at the back of St Stephen's Church to worship and to hear God's word and to reflect on it now. When I was a curate, quite a long time ago now, I was in a chapter which is the group of local vicars uh, and this was incredibly dull and boring for the most part, unlike our chapter here in Bath which is anything but. And my training vicar, Nigel, and I would make it more exciting by counting how many times one particular vicar mentioned that he'd been at Oxford University. Childish, 
I know, but needs must. And the record was five, incidentally. If you were to do the same for my sermons, of course you don't, but if you were to, I wonder what you'd have on your score sheet. One thing I say a lot is the opposite of faith is not doubt, but certainty. So, doubting Thomas. Poor doubting Thomas. Forever given this epithet, which kind of makes you go, oh, bless him. Poor little doubting Thomas. Well, I'm here to tell you that he needs not our pity, but our respect. Thomas, absent the first time Jesus appears, wants hard proof. He is firmly in the physical, the concrete, the, well, the flesh. When it comes to the second time, Jesus appears to them even though the door is locked and offers Thomas his wounds to touch as proof. But Thomas no longer needs this. He is overwhelmed with the very presence of the risen Christ and says straight away, my Lord and my God. Proof is so much what so many people seem to need. I have my score sheet of phrases. How can there be a God with so much evil in the world? How can we trust such an ancient book? If only I could see a miracle, then I would believe. I've heard them all so many times. And I've also got another score sheet for other more encouraging things, often heard at a funeral or a baptism or wedding. I was brought up religious, but if you were my vicar, I'd go to your church. I've never heard God talked about quite like that. I'm spiritual, but not religious. All of them valid, of course. The Celtic writer, John O'Donoghue, who sadly died in 2008, says that so many people have had their spirituality or sense of spirituality deadened by religion to the extent that they think it's naive or doom-laden or illusion-ridden. I certainly identify with that. But he says that the thing to do, as with anything, is where you can go back to the primary sources, to those writing by those who, rather than being deadened, are excited, vitalised, and nourished. Such for me are the early church writers, the mystics, and those who write in Celtic contexts. Last week in my sermon I mentioned that I've been looking more deeply into Celtic theology, like that of the Iona community how the Celtic cross, like the one that you'll see on this video, always has a circle with it, and how the circle represents the cosmos, all of creation, and the cross is the mystery of the resurrection, and how the cosmos in Celtic language is called the big book, and the cross and the Bible are the little book and how all things are held within the love of God for all creation made us and loves us. Creation after all is a huge and a long story and the very word cosmos can also mean healing. One of the theologians I'm reading is a man called John Philip who was a, a warden at Iona. And he highlights two of the main ideas in Celtic thought. Firstly, Celtic spirituality is marked by the belief that what is deepest in us is the image of God. Sin 
has distorted and obscured that image, but not erased it. Much religion has a tendency to define us in terms of the ugliness of our sin, rather than the beauty of our origin. This is really the essence of what I've always thought, that essentially we are deeply loved, and that deep seed of God's image in us cannot be tarnished. I've always felt that we can't really get a handle on our sin and the sin of the world until we know the love of God set so deeply within us. When God gazes on us, God sees us as we were intended to be, not ugly, but beautiful. Secondly, says John Philip Newell, Celtic theology believes in the essential goodness of creation, not just as a blessing, but as the very showing of God. The big book, the book of creation. John O'Donoghue says the world is not just dead geography, a place of our functional journeys, but rather a landscape that is at least as alive as we are, but in a different form. So we have the inner life, the image of God planted deeply within us, and the outer life, our life within the big book of creation. So how do we apply that to our reading? about doubting Thomas. Well, I think there are a lot of strains of the Celtic within it. Whereas much of our Christianity, much of the church is focused on the material, on the words and the laws, the doctrines, the nuances of belief, things that can be codified or defined, things of the mind, certainty, Celtic thought is far more open to the mystery and the wonder of life, the elements of the spirit, of the rhythms, the imagination, the things of the heart and the soul. Thomas, doubting, wants solid proof, the certainty of the material. And Jesus offers him this, but also gives the disciples his breath. Peace be with you. Receive my spirit. In this, Thomas gets a glimpse of the big book, the cosmic Christ. And this is all he needs, my Lord and my God. So you might be thinking, well, this is all very lovely, all nice, touchy-feely spirituality. It's okay to be in the flow of the stars and the wind, but where's the reality of it all? If we are to hold seriously the wonderful truth that what is deepest in us is the image of God, then we have to hold that that image is also deepest in other people. Just as we are encouraged to gaze into our very soul with God's kindly eyes, so when we see others, we have the same eyes. We look deeper than their annoying habits or their beliefs or politics, their ideas or behavior, deeper than our history with them, if we know them, what they've done to us or us to them. We look, as God does, into the depths of who they are. And this is not easy. But this is what Jesus has in his heart when he says, love 
your enemy. This is what Jesus demonstrates as he spends countless hours with those society deems unclean. Jesus looks beyond their illness or their infirmity or their poverty straight into the irreducible spark of God's image in their soul. In other words, this theology liberates the image of God in us, liberates Jesus from religion and into the true fullness of life. And if God is in the very beauty of creation, then that means we look at it beyond its functionality, what the earth can do for us, what can we get out of it, to the deep truth that is the big book of creation, that it holds us and blesses us. This theology is innately practical. To live it fully, we need that constant and abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. It roots us in the earth and also in the cosmos. And it connects us in the deepest ways possible to other people and all living things. At Easter, we get an extra reminder of this. Resurrection was not just a one-off, but is a constant. Jesus is reborn, bearing his wounds. So for us, we don't seek to avoid our wounds, but to bear them as Christ did, and allow our wounds to be the seeds of our growth and our nourishment. This is true sacramental living, a full intertwining of heaven and earth. Someone I know in our churches here, who I know will want to remain anonymous, sent me this on Monday of this week from Father Richard Raw. The natural world is constantly dying and being reborn in different forms. God appears to be resurrecting everything, all the time and everywhere. It is not something we necessarily believe in as much as it is something to observe and to be taught by. going to finish with another prayer by John Philip Newell. You are above me, O God, you are beneath. You are in air, you are in earth. You are beside me, you are within. O God of heaven, you have made your home on earth in the broken body of creation. Kindle within me a love for you in all people and in all things. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And we're going to continue in our prayer now. Just to warn you that I am filming in a public space and there are people very close, so they may well come through at some stage, but we're not going to let that worry us. They'll be welcome, of course. In this hallowed space in which we are blessed to pray, we bring ourselves to God. We confess the time when we allow our sin to obscure God's image in us. But we know that all the stuff we get wrong is not as deep in us as God's love. And we trust that love for our forgiveness and our healing.
open our eyes. Open our hearts to see you in all people and in all things. Help us to love you more and more. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring to you, O God, your troubled world. We pray for those in Ukraine and in Russia, in Gaza and in Israel. We pray especially this week for the WCK workers. We pray that that awful tragedy May be the tipping point into a more compassionate approach and to a solution of peace. We pray for those in Syria and Yemen and Sudan who are also living in fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for migrants and all displaced people. And we pray for governments to make merciful policies. We pray for our nation and all that we are facing at the moment. And we pray for integrity and honesty in our leadership. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring to you our church and all the divisions within it. Pray for our bishops, Michael and Ruth, for Adrian, our Archdeacon, and Stephen, our area dean. Pray for your mission here at St. Stephen's and at St. Mary's. For Andrew and Debbie, for our wardens, and for all who worship with you. pray for our world that we may live sustainably and we pray for those who are suffering through climate change, those for whom the weather is either meaning a loss of livelihood or even life itself. And we pray for responsible policies and selflessness in seeking the good of your creation and of generations to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pray for those who need our prayers at the moment. Sally Pym, Bob Carlton Porter, Caroline Kay, Mike Clare, Tory Peters, Simon. Pray for Gabriella and for John Oswin, Michael and Sylvia Tregor. And those who have commun communion at home, Bridget and Barry, Mary Young, Paul and Caroline Chaudroy and Simon Marshall. And some space now for you to hold in your heart those that you want God to meet and to bless at this time. in your mercy hear our prayer we pray for those who have died recently and their families and friends pray for Debbie's father Liv Richard Lurwell whose funeral was this week for mum Sheila sister Chris and the rest of her family for Eddie Eggleton who lived opposite St Stephen's for dear Bill Fraser former church warden of St Mary's, much loved. They lived in houses, you can't see them, but they're just over there beyond the trees. And for Carolyn Cowley's sister, Brenda Meaden, who died last week, and for all her family. So do remember those you know who are grieving at the moment. O oh Christ, Kindle in our hearts within a flame of love to our neighbour, to our foes, to our friends, to our kindred all. We bring our prayers together in the words that Jesus taught us. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Don't forget, if you're not on our mailing list and you'd like to find out more about our work in the churches, then please get in touch with the office at office at stephensbath.org.uk. And please, if you're able to come to the churches, please continue to bring food for our food banks, um, which the people are still, even though the weather's warming up, people are still desperate for that food and all of it goes. And you can go online to find out what specific things you can bring. Be wonderful sharing this time with you and I'm going to leave you with a Celtic blessing. May the peace of Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. And the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Redeemer and Abiding Spirit, be with you and remain with you and all you love, pray for and remember in this sacred place and sacred moment.